the politicians, the media, they're all the ben- and, and the major corporations, of course, they are the beneficiaries of inflation. And the uh, victims of inflation are essentially duped into voting for their own impoverishment because they're told they're going to be getting some of the spoils. But the spoils that they get are a tiny little fraction of the wealth that gets stolen from them. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today is the author of the Fiat Standard and the Bitcoin Standard, who also runs his online learning platform at safedean.com. Dr. Safedean Amos, welcome to Trigonometry. Thank you for having me, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. It is a great pleasure to have you on. Before we get into the conversation itself, tell everybody a little bit about who are you, how are you where you are, what has been your journey through life that leads you to be sitting here talking to us? Well, um, I'm Palestinian, Jordanian, and um, I uh, got a PhD in sustainable development from Columbia University. And I was a university professor in the Lebanese American University when I came across this new interesting toy called Bitcoin. And then it fascinated me and then it drew me in like a black hole and took over everything in my life. And I left my university job and I started teaching online. So now I'm independent. Um, I just teach to students directly online and I write books and um, I talk to interesting people on the Internet like you. Mm. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. You, I've listened to many of the things you've, you've uh, spoken about and read some of your work. Uh, you're a very smart man much smarter than me or Francis. So what we wanted to do is to go through the basics for us and our audience to get a basic understanding, first of all, about money and then about Bitcoin and and maybe other crypto stuff as well. So first question is, what is money? The short answer is money is a medium of exchange. It's something that people buy not for its own sake. You don't buy money because you want to eat it, because you want to look at it, because you want to use it for a certain thing. It doesn't have a function in and of itself. Its only function is that you plan on later exchanging it for something else. That's what distinguishes money from all other goods. It's something that you don't buy for its own sake, but for the sake of exchanging it for something else. And so... um, That is what we call the function of medium of exchange because it's just something that you use for exchange. And essentially, this is something that has developed naturally as humans, um, you know, as as human society became more complex, as humans lived and started trading with more people, we started developing more products, we started living in larger societies. The idea of trading things directly for one another becomes increasingly impractical. You know, if it's just five people on an island, then all the, all the, the only things that they can produce are, you know, maybe five or 10 things or 20 things between them. It's easy for them to keep track and to just exchange things directly. But, uh, but as the number of people grows, it becomes difficult for them to exchange things directly for one another because, you know, the thing that you want to, um, you would like to acquire is um, held by somebody who doesn't have the thing that you want to give them. And so they don't, they're not interested in your apples, but you're interested in their oranges. They're interested in bananas. So you need to find somebody who has bananas and wants your apples and you give them the bananas. You give them the apples, you take the bananas, and then you give the bananas to the guy with the oranges and he gives you the oranges that you want. So um, as naturally, you know, as the number of goods increases in an economy, naturally people start buying things not for the sake of holding them but for the sake of exchanging them and these things are media of exchange but over time you know bananas do a pretty bad job of being money because um, you know they spoil in a few days and uh, not a lot of people want bananas if the guy that you uh, wanted to uh, give the bananas to changes his mind then you're not going to find a lot of people who want the bananas so over time um, the things that end up playing the role of money end up ha- acquiring certain, end up having certain properties that make it that make them uh, suitable for the purposes of being a medium of exchange of being exchanged. And um, you know, some of these properties are that it is divisible. You know, bananas aren't very easy to divide into smaller pieces, and that you can combine small pieces into one big piece, so the whole thing is homogenous. And oh, another property is that it is portable, that you can move it around. So houses aren't very good as money because you can't move a house around. You can't take it with you. Same is true with land. And um, I think 
over time though you know what ends up uh, what ended up being the most uh, uh, common form of money around the world by the end of the 19th century was gold and so in my book the bitcoin standard i begin by explaining what it is that makes things good as money and why is it that gold was the world's only money at the end of or the world's prime money at the end of the 19th century and my explanation for that is that the property that matters the most for monetary selection is monetary hardness how hard the money is because that determines the ability of the money to hold on to its value over time and in the long run that ends up being the most important property because you know bananas will rot um, fish or any kind of food will also rot um, other metals will rust and decay and corrode but gold doesn't rust doesn't corrode and more importantly gold because it doesn't rust and corrode we're constantly stockpiling more and more gold all over the world and we're not consuming it you know it doesn't you 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 consume copper you put copper in machines and then the machines run out and the copper disintegrates and rusts and is thrown away but you don't consume gold you know you uh, people mined gold 5000 years ago and that gold is still running around the world today being gold it's in somebody's necklace or in somebody's gold coin it's still there it doesn't rust it doesn't corrode it doesn't ruin so the result of this the implication of this is that we have thousands of years of gold production piling up so all thing, the... can i interrupt just with a sure. very layman question what's the mm -hmm. difference between gold and silver and why do we perceive gold as having more value than silver yep that's a great question so the difference primarily is that uh silver can tarnish and can uh, and and can ruin and it does get used um it does get used up but gold is not that does not ruin at all and gold is more scarce in the earth's crust and it's mm. harder to find so historically silver had a lower value than gold um we had a bigger abundance of silver but the those two metals were the two monetary metals by the beginning of the 19th century before that you know copper and iron had been used as money but then they lost their monetary role as well and the reason for that is their monetary their non-monetary uses or their industrial uses became pretty significant so people were using copper for all manner of things and that leads to the corrosion of the copper and so therefore what happens is if this is why you know a lot of people say well money is just a hallucination or money is just a, a shared uh, a, a shared social contract between people you know we can decide that we want gold to be money or we could decide that we want copper to be money or we could decide we want pigskin to be money and if we all decide it hard enough then we can make it money and i think that's completely nonsense if we all decide that we want to make copper money tomorrow it doesn't matter how hard we want it it doesn't matter if everybody sells everything that they have and buys and puts all of their and stores all of their value in copper it's not going to work as money and the reason is you keep the, the if we buy if we if we keep stockpiling copper and we keep using it as a store of value the people who are able to mine copper are just going to keep mining more because the more we buy it mm. and use it as money the more its price goes up the more the miners are incentivized to produce more of it the more they produce of it the more they bring it on the market they crash the price so no matter how much you want to store copper as a store of value eventually the mining production will uh, catch up with you and it will bring the price down it's not possible to keep the price of copper significantly high because it's very easy for people to make more of it and because it rusts and corrodes and gets used up the quantities that we stockpile will you know will eventually um decline you know they will get used up in, in, and they will corrode and so new production is a large percentage is a large percentage of existing stockpiles this is true for all commodities and all goods with the exception of silver and gold mm. those are the two ones that manage to maintain large stockpiles wherein annual new production is small compared to the existing stockpiles in the case of silver historically this was around five percent so every year we add about five percent to the stockpile of silver a little bit of it gets consumed but we add around five percent in the case of gold we're adding historically around one and a half to two percent only so every year you're only adding one and a half to two percent to the stockpile of gold and every year we get better at finding gold you know every year we develop more machinery better technologies for digging for gold but what that leads to is that we 
um, you know, we, we, we never are able to make, you know, a 20% increase in the supply of gold because we get marginally better this year, but then that just means that the production of this year gets added onto the stockpiles. The stockpiles get bigger. So the production next year, even though it's bigger, it's still, it's still the same kind of fraction because the stockpile is also bigger. Mm. So that ratio of the supply increase uh, annually, in the case of gold, has always been around one and a half to two percent, and that's why historically I think gold became money. Silver was like in second place; um, it had about a five percent growth increase. But the advantage that silver had is that it was more divisible than gold. You know, a, a silver coin is what people would use for small day-to-day transactions, whereas a mm-hmm. gold coin would be something that you would use for bigger transactions. So you'd mm-hmm. buy a house with a few gold coins, you'd buy your lunch with a silver coin. Um, but over time, what ended up happening in the late 19th century is that as banking developed um, and, and modern banking allowed for people to just make financial instruments backed by gold, then it didn't matter how divisible gold was. You know, We could have the British pound backed by gold Mm. And you could make a payment with a piece of paper that was backed by gold, and it didn't matter. You know, you didn't have to cut up the gold coin itself. The the, mm. uh, the pieces of paper were divisible, and so the the use of silver as gold began to decline toward the end of the 19th century, and then its value continued to decline. So around the mid 19th century, the price of silver in terms of gold was 15 to 1. So 15 ounces of gold, 15 ounces of silver would buy you one ounce mm. of gold, something in that range. Today, it's around 100 or so. So it's wow. dropped significantly. Silver has mm. lost its value um, significantly compared to gold Safety toward the end of the 19th century. Just yeah. to jump in again, I know you're probably going there anyway, but it seems like we're, we're getting to the point of we're talking about... Uh, you know, gold is fairly consistent in having a certain value. And you talk about creating currencies that are linked to gold. And then comes a point in human development when that link is broken. And that, I think, is where a lot of the modern issues we have uh, that we're probably going to talk about a little bit. So talk to us about that and, and how we got there and how that decision was made and some of the consequences of that. Yep, this is a, a major theme in my two books, the Bitcoin Standard and my second book, the Fiat Standard. Um, so in the Bitcoin Standard, I trace the development up, to, up until this point where gold basically won over all the other monies. And the conclusion that I get to is that the hardest money always wins. And we also have several other examples. You know, you look at seashells and, you know, when gold comes into a society that has seashells, uh, the seashells lose their monetary role because it's easy um, you know, it's not because people just think, oh, well, gold is shiny and yellow. It's because people keep making more seashells, and but they can't make more gold. So the people who have gold maintain the value of their wealth in the gold, but the people who have seashells witness their wealth disappear. So uh, it, it's not a matter of choice. And this is, this is uh, I think, the main issue that a lot of economists don't get. They tell you it's a matter of choice. No, it doesn't matter how many people choose to hold seashells. It's uh, it, it's the choice only hurts the person. It doesn't affect the consequence. Inevitably, gold is going to drive out seashells. Your choice is whether you go poor holding seashells or you trade your seashells quickly while they still have value for some gold and you manage to maintain some wealth. So this is what happened. And I think um, I personally think this was, you know, the development of the gold standard is not just me, but a lot of people also think the development of the gold standard at the end of the 19th century, when the entire planet was basically using the same money and all the global currencies were effectively uh, just different weights of uh, gold. So there was no exchange market as it is today, where, you know, the price of the dollar and the pound and the yen are fluctuating. The dollar and the pound and the yen and the, all the other currencies were just different weights of gold, mm. specific number of grams of gold. And so the exchange rate hardly ever moved. There was no foreign exchange market uh, variation. Uh, it was just uh, similar to the exchange between meters and inches and uh, different units. They were fixed. So all of the world running on one currency, and that currency being hard, in my opinion, is basically the pinnacle of human civilization at the peak, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century. That's when all of the most incredible and important inventions were uh, invented. Everybody anywhere in the world could save money into the future, and they could be quite confident that it would hold on to its value. You know, you mm. didn't have to be an expert in financial markets as you have to be today 
knowing, understanding stocks and bonds and commodities and monetary policy and all of these arcane fields in order to be able to maintain the wealth that you've earned. You could be a butcher, a shoemaker, um, you could have any kind of job, and then you get, get paid in a gold coin, and you just held on to that gold coin, and you knew that 10 years down the line, that gold coin will buy you slightly more than what it bought you when you earned it. You didn't have to go out and speculate in a stock market casino in order to just keep the wealth that you had. So then 1914 comes about, and that's the topic that I focus on in my second book, The Fiat Standard. And we move from the gold standard to the fiat standard, where effectively governments, and it's, it's, it's a long process, and I describe the details in the fiat standard, and um, like a lot of bad things that have happened in the world, started all in England. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, a lot of all good things as well, you know, the steam engine and football and the three-piece suit. Uh, you, you guys have done good things as well. But, you know, you destroyed the gold standard, which was <laughs> a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake. Um, but that led to the replacement of gold, which had an annual supply growth rate of around 15 to 2% with national currencies, which in the last 60 years, you know, you look at the data from 1960 until today, 2020. In those 60 years, we see that the average money supply increased at around... 15 percent or so um in the world uh, and so per year per year yeah um wow you know that, yeah so, like, so what's the total increase then since 1960 uh, it's enormous i mean it if insanely you, big it is it absolutely is i mean in the best currencies you know the, the better currencies like the us dollar or the swiss franc or the danish kroner these kind of currencies they've increased at around maybe seven, six, seven, eight percent on average that's the best you know that's four or five times the rate of increase that you had uh, with gold and but of course you know you look in the history of the 20th century you see an enormous number of countries that suffered hyperinflation which is something that never happened on the gold standard mm. and on the all of these hyperinflations you know the money supply was increasing at maybe 100% 200% maybe 500% in a year so the value of the currency was getting destroyed so the average fiat user in the last 60 years would expect that their money would be diluted by 14% per year that's the number that i calculate fiat being fiat. normal currency just for for late yeah. in late person yeah. yeah government money basically government it's money, money because right. yeah it's money because government says it's money and safety can i ask why did the 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 evil english in 1914 do this because they wanted to fight a war actually this is something that is amazing they don't teach you this in your history books and it's something that um you know the, the history books in england completely uh, paper over this there was a huge inflation price inflation that happened in england during world war one but uh, you don't talk much about it but only in uh, 2017 you know 100 years after uh, the event did the bank of england a bunch of people in the bank of england dug into the basement and found a bunch of papers that explained what actually happened and it was published quite recently um and interestingly enough you know the uh, when the world war began and it wasn't a world war then it was just a bunch of uh, european kings fighting each other then the british wanted to interfere and the uh, government introduced a sale of bonds to finance the war the English people, being, you know, not sociopaths, did not <laughs> buy that bond issue. They didn't buy a third of the bonds. So the government had a problem on its hand. You know, they wanted to go out and kill a bunch of Europeans. But the English people had better things to do with their money than go kill Europeans. So they only bought about a third of the money that the British government needed. So what did the Bank of England do? Well, the Bank of England got a couple of members of the bank, a couple of people who worked at the bank, high-ranking officials the bank of england basically gave them a credit line in their own name and they went and bought two-thirds of the bonds in their own name and then a certain uh, rag in england called the financial times you may have heard of it <laughs> they published a story saying you know the bond issue was oversubscribed and it was extremely successful and the people of england really do want to join this war and it's going to be a great um victory for england because we have all the resources we need and of course remember it was an august bank holiday it was going to be just you know a quick uh, a quick uh, tour into europe where we're going to go and uh, establish our dominance and come back and that was the idea but of course when they did that what ended up happening is you know essentially they issued a lot of credit money and paper money not backed by gold mm. and so as a result the value of the paper money began to decline and as a result, they started collecting the gold from people's uh, hands. And so they instructed the post offices and the banks 
to only take payment, uh, to only make payment in paper money. So, and they told everybody to hand over their gold to their local post office and bank because that was needed for the war effort. And if you weren't doing that, then you know you were uh, basically uh, a traitor, effectively. So, with this kind of emotional manipulation, they managed to get gold out of circulation and get people to use the papers. Mm -hmm. And of course, the consequence of that was that prices rose. So, during World War One, prices more than doubled. And then after World War One, there was a big recession and a big problem in England, and uh, they were trying to get back on the gold standard at the old rate, but they couldn't do it because they had a whole bunch of other money, a whole bunch of new money that was circulating. And so it, it's it, it's like a comedy of errors where, you know, it's like we're watching one of these um, um, slapstick comedy movies, but, you know, with hundreds of millions of dead people, where, uh, you know, they make this lie, and then they just keep making bigger lies to try and cover it up. And um, the money supply keeps increasing, and the, that creates more problems, more inflation, more economic disasters, um, destroys people's livelihood, destroys people's savings, and creates you know economic recessions and all these problems. And then, in order to cover it up, what do they do? You know, almost like an episode of Benny Hill, they go and they print more money to fix it, and then it just continues to get worse and worse. And then um, that effectively leads to Britain losing the British pound as the global reserve currency and the dollar, which was managed by people who are slightly less insane than the Bank of England. Uh, so it was much stronger and got a lot of gold flowing into the US from Europe. The dollar takes over as the global reserve currency and it becomes the global uh, money that is you know, used all over the world. But of course, you know, the Americans then started using that as well. And then in 1971, all the world goes off uh, any kind of link with gold, where the bank of uh, where the US Federal Reserve uh, stops or in the US Treasury, they stop redeeming gold in, uh, for their dollars. And then there's no limit on how much they can uh, print. And so from 1971 onwards, uh, national currencies all over the world are backed by basically nothing. It's just governments that are just printing. And since then, we see price inflation takes off and government debt takes off and um, we just i think you know it's um, it's 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 at the root of a big 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 number if not the vast majority of economic problems all over the world but of course it's not something that is discussed extensively in your economics textbooks at university because your economics textbook is uh, written by people who get paid from that printed money so they turn your attention to all kinds of other inconsequential bullshit instead <laughs> hey kk do you believe in spring cleaning yes but only when my wife does it in russia men who clean are executed for not being real men which is correct well, for those men who are living in the 21st century, Manscaped has an incredible offer for you. Manscaped are the global leaders in men's below-the-waist grooming and have forever changed the grooming game with their amazing performance package 4.0. Inside this care bundle, you'll find their lawnmower 4.0, trimmer, weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer, crop preserver, ball deodorant, crop <laughs> reviver toner, <laughs> performance boxer brief, and a travel bag to hold your goodies. This elite trimmer is designed to trim hair on loose skin. Although your wearables might look like a couple of Boris Johnsons, treat them with respect and benefit from their proprietary skin safe technology. Complete your grooming game this spring with the new refined cologne signature scent by Manscaped. This stuff is legit and will have you smelling like royalty. The good kind, not Prince Andrew. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code TRIGGER20 at manscaped.com. The start of spring also marks the start of Testicular Cancer Awareness Month in April. Manscaped has partners with the Testicular Cancer Society to bring awareness to testicular cancer, men's health, and early cancer detection. Manscaped is committed to raising awareness for the most common form of cancer in men aged 15 to 35. Our age. Exactly. And giving support for fighters, survivors, and families impacted by testicular cancer as part of their We Save Balls initiative. Gents, you now have the perfect excuse to check yourself on a regular basis. Get stuck in. That's a huge worry for the world, isn't it? Particularly as because in the COVID era, we've all been printing huge amounts of money. And before that in 2008. 
And by yeah. the way, can I just say before you answer that question, as an honorary Englishman now, I've got no problem with my money going to annoy Europeans or whatever. <laughs> mess it up. That, that's that's very much on brand for us. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's true. It is it is a major problem. <laughs> it is a major problem all over the world. I think um, you know it's 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 amazing when you if if you follow the news over the last year in particular, you know, inflation is rising everywhere, prices of everything is going mm. up. Mm. Now listen to the mainstream media, listen to the PhDs in economics. Why is this happening? There's an infinite number of reasons that they'll bring up. You know, it's happening because of supply chain disruptions, and it's happening because of the virus, and it's happening because of this and that and the other thing and it's you know it's all distraction from the one very very obvious cause which is that the money supply just keeps going up mm -hmm. and it's you know you look at the rate of increase in the money supply it's just always going up it's it's gone up vertically over the last couple of years but it had always been going up and the problem with this inflationism is it's, it's like a drug addiction where you know that there's no such a thing as a moderate heroin user um <laughs> it's it's addictive so you need more and more and more and so even if initially, let's say in the 80s, inflation seemed like it was under control in the 80s and in the 90s, well, inflation, the, the, the more it seems like it is under control, the more tempting it is to engage in more of it. And then the more you engage in it, the more problems you create. And then if you think that inflation can solve those problems, then you were going to try and solve the problems of inflation with more inflation, which is what they're doing. And I think it is a huge problem. It's something that... Um, Proper economists, uh, what, I, what I like to think of as proper economists, you know, are the alternative schools of economics, the Austrian school of economics, which is what I consider myself um, a part of. They've been uh, harping on about this for more than a century now, that this is the biggest problem in the world economy. And they are marginalized because, you know, there are a lot of very powerful interests that benefit from money printing. And so um, they'd like to deflect away from this and focus on you know all other uh, other kinds of inconsequential bullshit. but now it's you know the world's waking up onto the fact it's very hard to it's it's becoming harder and harder for establishment economists and central bank to continue to make the astonishingly absurd lie that no 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 our money printing is helping fight the price inflation we're not responsible for the price inflation the reason prices are rising is because of other things and our money printing is how we're fixing this it's becoming less and less tenuous in mm. many more people's and, minds and if we if we you know the people of england or the people of britain or the people of america went to the ballot box and we had a, a choice of somebody who wanted to bring us back onto the gold standard is that even possible now or have we just are we just too drugged up now and there's no way out <laughs> Um, I think theoretically it is possible. Like if you voted for somebody, yeah, he could do it. Uh, it would uh, it would require a massive revaluation of gold. So the price of gold would go up to maybe something like ten thousand pounds an ounce or twenty thousand pounds an ounce. So theoretically it is possible, but practically and politically it's impossible. So if you look at somebody like Ron Paul in the U.S., um, you know, uh, he had a lot of grassroots support, but he could not translate that into political effective uh, success because um and this this is really the really pernicious thing about this it's um it's it's a very sustainable equilibrium because once uh, once you, uh, you once you've started printing money then the people who are in government have an enormous amount of power over society and so they are able to use that power in order to get themselves reelected mm. and if you're going in with the agenda of i am not going to use the money printer it's kind of like going into war without a weapon, you know, because mm. um, politics is the weapon, you know, democracy is I'm going to give you free ponies and free hospitals and all of the nice things that you want, you know. And so the more promises you make, the more votes you get. So if you run on a platform of screw you, I'm not going to give you anything. You're going to have to work for things. <laughs> You're not going to make it in politics. So a lot of people have tried, and uh, there have been a lot of economists and a lot of politicians who have run on this kind of hard money, let's go back to gold platform, but it's a dead end. Um, the bureaucracy, the politicians, the media, they're all the, and, and the major corporations, of course, they are the beneficiaries of inflation. 
And the uh, victims of inflation are essentially duped into voting for their own impoverishment because they're told they're going to be getting some of the spoils. But the spoils that they get are a tiny little fraction of the wealth that gets stolen from them. And, and that's the perniciousness of the scam, you know? So you're witnessing your savings destroyed. You're witnessing your ability to save for the future destroyed. And you're willingly giving it up because you're voting for people who are promising you, you know, we're going to give you free this and free that. Um, but, uh, you know, we see what how this ends up. Uh, it, it ends up with a lot of, um, you know, the, nothing is free. At the end of the day, you're just promising these things to be done with central planners. Central planners are going to be doing those things and it's just going to um, end up being more and more expensive and it's going to end up destroying the currency even more. So um, I don't really think that uh, political solutions are uh, possible. This is a job for Superman. This is a job for Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we segue nicely into Bitcoin. So look, Here's the thing, Safedean. In I think it was in 2011, a friend of mine told me, uh, he gave me two pieces of advice, get into silver, and he said, get into Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. And obviously me being skint, as a skint comedian, I, I didn't have the option of doing it. I had no idea what Bitcoin is. I still don't really understand what Bitcoin is. Can you do a basic layman explanation of what Bitcoin is? And actually, why it's so powerful in today's economy? Yeah. So Bitcoin, um, you know, the, the I'm not going to get into the technical aspect of it because mm. it's it, it's going to take a lot of time to go into that. So I'm just going to discuss it functionally. You know, I'm not going to explain how the car works. I'm just going to tell you what a car does. Mm. Um, and the importance of Bitcoin is that it is a form of money. It's a digital form of money that exists on the internet that is controlled by nobody. Nobody is in charge of Bitcoin. It's a protocol that um, anybody can use, but nobody can control. So it only has users. It doesn't have admins. And the really, really important thing about it, which is the focus of my first book, The Bitcoin Standard, is the idea of hardness. Remember when I said uh, gold mm -hmm. is the hardest money, 1.5% increase? Well, Bitcoin is even harder than gold. It's um, becoming harder. It's now increasing at around 2%. It started off increasing at a pretty high percentage uh, rate of increase, but that rate declines over time. And now it's at 2%, and it's going to continue to decline. And then eventually it's going to uh, arrive at a growth rate of zero. So there's only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin. There's no way of making more than 21 million. So we've already made almost 19 million at the time uh, currently. And there's only going to be another 2 million Bitcoin that are going to be made over the next century or so. So the supply growth rate of Bitcoin has already dropped significantly. It's around the same range as gold right now. And in the next few years, it's going to decline below gold. And it's going to continue to decline until it eventually hits zero and then stops growing. So um, what I'll say, if you want the details for why, you should read my book. But basically, this is extremely credible. There's no way of anybody finding a way of making more Bitcoin. It doesn't matter how many petitions you sign. It doesn't matter how many media, how many university professors, how many academics, how many Keynesian textbooks you write. You can't make more Bitcoin. And so that's why Bitcoin basically, you know, it, it, it solves the problem of politics. We don't have to, um, we don't have to convince the crazy inflationists anymore. We don't have to reason with them. We don't have to win elections against them. This is money that just doesn't give a shit about what anybody thinks. It's just going to be there and it's only going to be 21 million. And your only option is to deal with it or as Bitcoiners like to say, cry harder. There's nothing you can do to change it or affect well, it. On that point, Safety, I don't understand Bitcoin or money nearly as well as you do, but I understand people and politics, I think, reasonably well. And the one thing I know is if a government has an incentive to punish you or to prevent you from doing something or to find a way to to prevent you from doing the things that they don't want you to do, they will eventually at least very, very hard look for a way very, very thoroughly and very, very hard. And I don't know if they can prevent you from making more Bitcoin or force you to make more or whatever, but what they can do is prevent you from using it somehow, right? There must be a way they can prevent you from buying things, from selling things. There must be a way they can 
punish you, they can make it illegal, for example, right? So isn't that a real concern going forward? It's like, okay, I hear you, it's a really hard currency, it's not going to increase by more than a specific amount, it's a very easy medium of exchange, it can be broken up, like it works in the way that money works. But isn't it, if it's in direct, directly against the interests of the people who run our world, they will find a way to prevent it from fulfilling that destiny, won't they? Um, uh, perhaps, but I think, you know, the more you look into how it functions, the more difficult it is to find a way in which they can stop it. Because ultimately, the, uh, this thing w was built precisely with the objective of resisting capture and attack by government. So it's not optimized for your user experience. It's not optimized for um, ease of use. It's not an Apple iPhone. It's, uh, you know, it's it's not this cute app on your phone that is just blowing your mind and how cool it is. It's not Netflix. It's not Apple. It's an ugly contraption. You know, think about it as like this uh, um, ugly machine that you use to make a dirty job, uh, to, to pull off a dirty job, but it does the job that you want. And that job is resisting capture by a central authority. And so... It, the, the key thing to understand here is that there's no single point of failure in Bitcoin. There's no, uh, there's no trusted party. There's nobody who is a critical, um, who is critical for the operation of Bitcoin. There's nobody you could kill to kill Bitcoin. There's no building you can bomb to destroy Bitcoin. There's no headquarters. There's no single computer. There's no single server anywhere in the world that you can take out and then you take out Bitcoin. Bitcoin is essentially a bunch of code. And so anybody who runs that code on their machine is able to join the Bitcoin network. So there are maybe 10 billion internet capable devices around the world between uh, phones and uh, laptops and servers and so on. Any of these just needs to uh, run the code uh, of Bitcoin and find a way of connecting to other machines uh, through the internet and maybe not even through the internet itself. You know, they could connect through uh, radios and you could connect through mesh networks, you know, not necessarily through the internet, but through just connecting through other computers that connect to other computers. With these kind of networks, you, you will be able to basically do Bitcoin. So what it would take but in order to shut it down. My question is something else, Safety. Sorry, my question is, at the end of the day, if money is a medium of exchange, and governments control whether you can convert Bitcoin into their money because that's what you're going to have to convert it into to buy stuff, right? They no, can cut you off there. That's the, that's the key thing. Like eventually okay. you don't have to. I mean, you don't have to convert Bitcoin into um, pounds in order to buy things. You can just give somebody Bitcoin and they give you things. And so the well, tricky can I, part can, here, Are we ever going to get to a point? Sorry to keep interrupting. I just want to hone in yeah. on this. Are we ever going to get to a point where you can save all your life savings in Bitcoin and then be able to buy a house if the government in that country has banned transactions in Bitcoin because it thinks they're immoral or illegal or, or undermining the economic system or whatever? They've decided Bitcoin's not allowed in our country. Am I ever going to be able to buy a house? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the example here to look at is... Uh, yeah. If you look at your average uh, country that has experienced hyperinflation over the past uh, century, and there's many of them, uh, when the currency begins to collapse and when there are problems, you know, people naturally move away from their local currency to dollars and pounds or euros, and they start using these currencies. And of course, governments will um, clamp down on these currencies and they will stop, uh, they will ban people from using them. But what that does is the exact opposite effect. So when you say you can't buy dollars with, uh, you know, our peso or our whatever it is, well, then what happens? <laughs> You're not going to destroy the dollar. You're just going to destroy your local uh, shitcoin, basically. So <laughs> you're just saying that this currency cannot buy real money. And so mm. people who hold this currency now value it less and they want to get mm. rid of it more and they don't want to get paid in it. So that's uh that's i think the reality in uh if you so um even if major governments decide to ban bitcoin you know that just gives a massive advantage to other governments to go and accumulate bitcoin or uh, people in other countries to accumulate bitcoin hold on to it and then um you know the people who are forced to use the uh inferior currencies of uh, their governments are just going to witness their wealth 
um, destroyed and the people who use Bitcoin are going to witness their wealth uh, accumulate. And I have several examples of this happening with gold and silver. So for instance, at the uh, late 19th century, China and India were the last two countries that were on a silver standard. And that was a massive, massive mistake for which they're still paying, I think, until today, because the value of silver continued to decline while the rest of the world was on gold. And so that's what allowed the British and the Europeans to essentially uh, economically dominate China and India because their money was appreciating while the Chinese and Indian money was depreciating. And so everything just got cheaper for foreigners in China and India so they could keep buying more and more things. And this is uh, this is effectively what you would be doing as a government if you ban Bitcoin. You're, um, you're basically... Um, picking the seashells. You're going with seashells and saying, yeah, we're just going to ban our peasants from using gold coins and then we'll be able to keep uh, them on the seashell standard and then gold will just go away. I don't think that's going to work. So, Dean, and what would you say to those people who go, look, you look at the fluctuations of Bitcoin, you know, it will surge and then it will crash, etc. It's not stable. It's not reliable. And actually, it's quite reckless to invest a lot of money in it. Uh, generally, what Bitcoiners say to those people is have fun staying poor. Uh, <laughs> this is the kind of very common uh, um, attitude. The idea is, yes, it is volatile, of course, but it is volatile going up. So the long term trend is always up. You know, Bitcoin's never been down on a three or four year horizon. It's always going up. It's uh, going up in many multiples of its value. So, yes, if you hold your local national currency, it doesn't fluctuate as much as Bitcoin, but it's trending down in real terms. Mm. You know, look at the price of houses in your local town in terms of your local currency anywhere in the world. You know, houses just keep it getting more and more expensive every year. Well, why? We keep building more and more houses, and the technology to make houses continues to get more efficient. So we have. You know, in real terms, houses are less expensive. We make them much more efficiently today. And yet the price of houses continues to go up. It's not the price of the house that's going up. It's the value of the currency that is going down. And so if so, if you hold on to your national currency for the long run, and even if you try to beat the inflation by investing in stocks or bonds, you're basically not beating inflation. It's very difficult to beat real inflation. When I say inflation, I don't mean the CPI number or the you know consumer price inflation statistics that the government puts out, which is just another form of fictional statistics from government. I mean the real inflation. You know, think about the house, your house of dream, the house of your dreams, where you'd love to live, and think about the price of that house. You know, look it up online if you can, and see what has happened to the price of that house over the last ten years. It is going up by much more than the CPI number. Think about all the things that you actually desire, the things that you really want, You know, um, the value of precious goods. It's going up much higher than inflation. And that's not uh, the thing becoming more valuable. It's the money becoming less valuable. So the answer to this is yes, Bitcoin's volatility is a problem in the short term. If you want to hold Bitcoin for the short term, it is a problem. If you have a lot of exposure to Bitcoin in the short term, um, and, you know, you have short-term liabilities, like if you're a business and you have to make um, payments, then, yeah, it is a tricky thing. You don't want to be fully in Bitcoin because um, you might not be able to make your payroll at the end of next month. So you do still need to hold some of your local operating, uh, some of your currency for your operating expenses. But if you want to think about the long term, you know, if you want to hold money for the next five, 10 years, um, Bitcoin is really the best option. And so... You have to have a long-term perspective on it, and you have to ignore the day-to-day -day noise and essentially understand that what we're witnessing is that this thing is just continuously going up, and it's going up because the supply is fixed. There's no way of making more of it. And so, um, you know, the sooner you get in, the more you're going to have and the more you're going to benefit and the less you're going to suffer from your local inflation. But, of course, you may not want to get in all in initially because of the volatility, particularly if you're a business. Um, I think... Perhaps that might be understandable, but um, in the long run, what you think about, what you want to, what what you want is you want to maintain value. You want to or increase the value, and Bitcoin really does this better than uh, anything else. Hi, Francis. Do you have your own business? No. What do you think trigonometry is? An opportunity for me to annoy people and shout catchphrases. 
Birds love it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <sighs> well, if you do run your own company, you'll know how important branding is to have a successful business. That's why you should work with the older files. Every project is carefully considered and tailored to ensure your brand is consistent and memorable to everyone it reaches. Most big city agencies are going to cost you an arm and a leg just so they can pay their overhead costs. The older files work remotely, so you don't have to worry about being overcharged. Not only that, they're a one-stop shop for all your branding needs, including brand development, online ad design, email design, web design, print design, motion graphics, and more. They do design, guys. <laughs> Visit theolderfiles.com forward slash triggered and fill out the project request form to get 10% off your first project and a free consultation. That's theolderfiles.com slash triggered and get 10% off your first project and free consultation. We have the saying here in the UK, which is safe as houses, and you've <laughs> alluded to the, the house price inflation that we are seeing. How would you say Bitcoin will compare to something like property over a 10, 15, 20 year period? I think, uh, I mean, we look at the past, it's, it's done much better than property. And I think it's likely could, going to continue to outperform uh, property. Um, and I think, you know, a big part of the reason why property continues to increase is that people use their houses as their saving accounts. Under the gold standard, you had a saving account which was backed by gold, and um, you would invest, you would buy the house that you'd need, and you would just uh, put, um, buy the house that you need as a consumption good. Now people think of their houses as their saving account. You know, this is where I put my wealth, and you maybe overinvest in housing because if you have a lot of money, you know, you'd rather have that money in a house than have it in a bank, right? It's a better investment. Or you buy more houses and you rent them out, which mm. leads to the situation where people who have money end up with a lot of houses and people who are young and who are just getting started, they can't afford to buy houses because their houses are being bid up by the people who already have the money because they're using them as a saving account. So, mm. you know, young people, the reason that young people can't afford housing and they need to get into, you know, enormous amounts of debt is that you're not just bidding against other people who want to buy a house. You're bidding against people who want to buy an investment, a saving account. Exactly. And I think the interesting thing is that Bitcoin is going to obsolete this use case for houses. So I think the long run, it's going to, you know, more and more people are discovering that you're better off putting your money in Bitcoin than putting it in a house. Therefore, I think over time, that's just going to return housing to being a consumer good where people buy the houses that they need to live in, not the houses that they, uh, you know, not, not saving accounts. You, you'll use Bitcoin as a saving account. Mm. So, Tim, I think one of the issues that people have with Bitcoin is it, it seems to be because it's such a new thing, there seem to be a lot of scam artists that you hear all these stories about people being scammed. Uh, you know, I, I got an email sent by my bank and now you can question the bank's motives for this, but basically saying there's a lot of people out there using Bitcoin, using crypto as a way to scam others. Is this being overstated or is this a problem in the market? No, I think it's true. I think it's uh, it's it's a new technology and it's very difficult for uh, people to figure it out quickly. You need a lot of time. You need to spend a lot of time uh, figuring it out and understanding it. Um, you know, nobody has, uh, nobody's born understanding Bitcoin. Uh, you need to spend a lot of time understanding it. So that is that creates a very rife environment for people to take advantage of people who are not very familiar with what's going on. And personally, I think, um, you know, my personal opinion is that uh, all the other digital currencies are effectively scams. Um, they're, uh, they pretend to be decentralized like Bitcoin, and that allows them to sell themselves as being the equivalent of Bitcoin, but they're not decentralized. Only Bitcoin has truly managed to be decentralized because, uh, you know, you look at the history of how Bitcoin has developed. The guy who made it, he was anonymous. Uh, he didn't, nobody knew who he was. It was just one person. Um, and he made it, he, you know, he, he, he put it uh, online for anybody to use. And then other people started to use it. And then he disappeared. And nobody knows who he is. Nobody knows uh, what happened to him. Um, he may be dead. He may have just, you know, gotten rid of that identity and... Uh, um, moved on with his life. But the important thing is that it's now been 11 years that he's been disappeared. So the 
the person, the only person who could control Bitcoin has been gone for 11 years and Bitcoin has been running for 11 years. So we can, and, and in those 11 years, a lot of people have tried to take control of Bitcoin. A lot of people have tried to make changes to Bitcoin and they've all failed. Bitcoin continues to refuse to be controlled. And so therefore, when I say 21 million Bitcoin, I know there's going to be only 21 million Bitcoin. I'm, you know, I'm comfortable going out there in public and putting my name out and saying, this is what's going to happen. And I know that if one day there's going to be more than 21 million Bitcoin, I'm going to have an entire bucket load of egg on my face. But I'm willing to take this chance because I think really the, the, the you know the, the mold's been broken and there's no way to uh, make another Bitcoin. There's no way to mess with Bitcoin. That's not the case with all the others. Once Bitcoin was up and running, it was the real thing. It was decentralized. Nobody could control it. And then if anybody came about and built a, another one, them building another one, was only going to um, work and is only going to succeed if they were able to be in charge of it, if they were able to be handling it. And that's why basically with all the other currencies, you know, it only takes you 15 minutes of digging to figure out who are the people behind it. And it's entirely easy for the people behind it to change the supply, change the rules. And we've seen that happen with pretty much uh, most of the big currencies that they run like startups, whereas Bitcoin is a neutral protocol. Bitcoin is like a language. You know, who controls the English language? Nobody. There's no authority that can say what is the English language. And to the extent that there are authorities that write dictionaries, you know, they don't make up new words. New words emerge and then they incorporate them into the dictionary. So, um, this is what Bitcoin is like, whereas all the others are, um, I, I, I believe, centralized. And I think, therefore, they're, uh, they're essentially fraudulent because they're uh, marketing themselves as decentralized, but really they're just securities. Um, it's, it's a bunch of people issuing financial liabilities. Mm. Mm. That, so, sorry. So, oh, sorry. So you'd say even a big currency like Ethereum, which loads of people have bought into, you know, which has become pretty much mainstream, you would say that that is not not a good investment no i i would not recommend anybody put any money in any digital currency other than bitcoin mm. and safety uh it's really interesting you've explained things so brilliantly in in a way that's simple to understand mm -hmm. and i really appreciate it. and your books do a great job of that as well can we talk a little bit about since you're making predictions about the moment that we find ourselves in right now as a as a, as a world particularly the western world uh, so let's just go back a little bit. 2008, you know, we have a massive financial crash. Our solution is to print a shit ton of money and give it away mainly to banks and to ourselves, right? Then, and, 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 and then we, we have, uh, you know, zero interest rates or maybe even negative interest rates, depending on how you want to look at it for however many years it's been, 14 years now. Um, then we have COVID when we go, okay, well, look, we've got this disease. Let in, I don't know what you guys did over there, but in this country, what we did is we went, stay at home, the government's going to give you shitloads of money that we're going to print, right? Now, you know, World War Three. if we all survive that, like, where are we going to be? Because, you know, we had people on the show two years ago going, inflation's coming, it's coming, and it's, it's, it's been coming, and now it's here. Like, what's happening economically, and what is the future going to look like? I mean, um, I don't have a crystal ball, so I, I, I don't really know, um, and I'm wary about making predictions in the future, but I think um, betting on these very strong, very persistent, uh, decades-long uh, trends to continue is probably the best bet. I think we're just going to be more of the same. Uh, we're going to have more money printing, more inflation, more devaluation of the currency, more price rises. And um, I think the dangerous thing uh, that we're seeing increasingly is that the more this money printing we get, the more power the government has. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, the last two years, just the insanity of the idea that government can just decide, all right, we don't want you to get sick. So, you know, uh, screw your business, screw your life, screw everything that you care about. You just need to stay home and we're going to lock you up. I think this is just completely uh, insane. Um and I think it's something that can only happen when a government has this insane tool that is a money printer. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people would say, well, 
what would happen if we were on a Bitcoin stand? A lot of people have asked me this question. What would happen if we were on a Bitcoin stand and then COVID comes along? How do you expect the government to shut down the world and give people free money? <laughs> and the answer mm -hmm. is exactly. They won't shut down the world. And then people would have to make their own choices. And I believe in a world in which people have to make their own choices, um, COVID would have been dealt with extremely far more efficiently. I think doctors would have done a much better job than what happens now when all these, you know, um, essentially... Uh, non-medical bureaucrats were making decisions for millions of people rather than letting doctors and patients make their decisions for themselves. And we saw this with a lot of these medicines, which I'm not going to mention because I don't want to get your YouTube channel uh, canceled. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of these medicines that came about that were proving very effective and many doctors were speaking about them. But the bureaucrats had, they didn't see any power in it. And so they were promoting the measures that involve power and submission and compliance and dependence you know they want to shut down your business so that you need the government for their money and then you'll have to vote for the government to give you more money and then and they'll be able to control you politically and they'll be able to control you more and more so i think it's a very very dangerous world and um another aspect of it is just the the, the amount of government propaganda that uh, we're seeing and the ability of the government to just brainwash everybody into marching along with everything that they want is extremely dangerous I think it's uh, sadly, I think things are just going to keep getting worse. And uh, of course, you know, nobody knows how things are going to get worse. I mean, uh, you know, if I asked you five years ago uh, what's going to happen in 2022, you know, you wouldn't have imagined that there's going to be a big war, uh, Russia and Ukraine. You wouldn't have imagined there was going to be a virus and break out. Um, these things just come out of nowhere and they show up. So I think, you know, we're going to be getting more and more of these kind of uh, dramas in uh, the next upcoming seasons of the fiat world um and things are going to keep getting worse and worse until bitcoin fixes things and i think it's just um, we need more and more people are going to wake up to bitcoin and they're going to join bitcoin not because of uh, you know not because of ideology not because they want to fight the government they want to take money out of the government they're going to join bitcoin because it uh, appreciates and it gives them um, you know it protects them from inflation it makes gains you know we call it number go up technology the price of bitcoin keeps going up people are going to come for the number go up and the more people join for the number go up the more bitcoin rises in value and the more that this free market monetary system grows as an alternative to the clown world of fiat um, that is just uh, threatening to <laughs> nuke the, the all of existence into oblivion. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like the final scene of a movie where will the hero manage to rescue the uh, sweetheart before the bomb goes off in the building or not? I think this is where we are right now, so stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> and on that wonderfully positive note, Safe Safe Dean, it's been it's been a great episode and thank you interview and thank you so much for coming for explaining to us and uh, illuminating not only myself but also our audience as to what Bitcoin is and the potentials of it. Uh, the yeah, last... I knew all about Bitcoin <laughs> safety in, in about, I can't remember when it was, probably about 2011, something like that. I bought 400 quid, 400 pounds worth of Bitcoin. And then a few years later, it doubled. It doubled to 800 pounds and triumphantly I sold it. What a, what a legend. <laughs> uh, and now that amount that I had, I think it was like half a Bitcoin or something is worth about 20 grand. Uh, so uh, I, knew, I knew even less than nothing about it. So thank you for coming on and talking about it. Uh, listen, we've got, before we ask you our questions from our supporters on Locals Only, uh, we have our usual question, which is the one we ask all our guests, uh, which is what is the one thing we're not talking about as a society that you think we really should be? Um, I'm going to go with meat. I think people should be eating more meat. Um, and uh, yes, government is constantly telling you that you need your grains and you need your veggies and you need your fruits. I think that's all bullshit. They want you to eat all of that crap because it's cheaper and um, eating meat is expensive and then it brings up inflation numbers. So that for the last 50 years, since we moved on the fiat standard, and I discussed this in detail in my book, um, governments have been uh, telling people to eat shit basically because uh, they want to cover it up. And then all these industrial food manufacturers have developed massively profitable business models of feeding people uh, industrial waste, which they make highly addictive. And uh, the way to beat that is to eat meat. I've eaten nothing but meat for the last six and a half years, and it's been the best thing that has ever happened to me. So I, I, I eat only meat, literally only meat and water, 
That's all I eat, and I highly recommend it. Um, you won't hear your nutritionist talk about it because your nutritionist's um, nutrition department is financed by industrial uh, food manufacturers. And if you eat meat, you don't desire the industrial junk that makes them a lot of money. So there's Our that. Our producer is a, is a passionate vegetarian. We're called trigonometry <laughs> for a reason. Yeah, he's walking off now, <laughs> no, I can yeah. see. That's yeah, it, he's, he's left. He's folded <laughs> he's his, his arms and he's furious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's fantastic. So safety.com for your lectures, the Bitcoin standard and the fiat standard, your two great books. We're going to ask you a couple of questions. But with that, thank you so much for coming on Trigonometry. And thank you all for watching and listening. We'll see you very soon with another brilliant episode like this one or our show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. And for those of you who like your trigonometry on the go, it's also available as a podcast. Take care and see you soon, guys. How concerned is safety by the Canadian government seizing the truckers' crypto wallets and the, uh, and the incoming regulations aimed specifically at crypto?